Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM released its long-awaited winter plan this week amid growing fears of a blackout. Chair and Screamer joins me to discuss the utility's prognosis for the coming few months. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. The headline news is that Stage 8 is a real possibility. Yes, I think that is the key takeaway from the long-awaited winter outlook. I think uh, there was a view that ESCOM should have given this a lot earlier. But I think it's been running the numbers and there's a lot of balls in the air with the new electricity minister, with the National Energy Crisis Committee. So I think what they wanted to communicate the message once they were ready to do it and had discussed with different stakeholders. And basically the headline news, as you say, is that stage eight is a distinct possibility uh, this uh, winter season. I don't think it will come as much as a surprise to South Africa. We've been in you know, we've only had two days of no load shedding this whole entire 2023. And many of the days that we have had load shedding, there's been, we've dipped into stage six, which is around 6,000 megawatts of, uh, of power cuts rotating around the country. Uh, so th th the fact that it starts winter on the back foot, which is really because it doesn't have the 2,100 megawatts out of Cresilia because of the, the stack collapses of October last year, and those are going to be restored at a lower rating by November, December, which will bring us about 1,500 megawatts instead of the 2,000 that was lost, 2,100 was, was lost through the temporary stacks. And then also Kuberg's extended maintenance being delayed, the return to service being delayed, means they're sitting in a sort of 3,000 megawatt worse position than they should have been. So then given the state of the coal fleet, which is very unpredictable, unreliable, under-maintained, all the things we already know, sabotage prone, corruption prone. I think uh, it's all combined with a sense that there could be a colder winter than last year as well. So obviously predicting the exact level of load shedding is difficult. I think if we can f say for almost certainty that there's going to be just about daily load shedding during the next three months. But uh, what levels are difficult because it's not just a supply issue, it's also a demand issue. And if it is colder and everyone in Gauteng in particular starts putting on heat, space heating, it's could, you know, the peak could be higher uh, than the current prediction is 33,000 megawatts peak. And I see even this week we've been getting to those sort of levels during peak period. So we could have higher peak if it gets colder. So the issue of then what, the, what supply will you have on those days? And that's very much dependent on the state of the coal fleet and how much diesel they can burn. Now we know that there's, uh, there is diesel available, but the state of the coal fleet we know is unreliable, unpredictable. What action is ESCOM <laughs> trying to take to navigate these high demand months? There are very few levers. You know, as I mentioned, there's the biggest one I think that ESCOM can use is really diesel. It's very expensive, it's undesirable, but I think in the context, they're going to need to burn a lot more diesel. So 20 billion has been set aside for their own fleet for the whole financial year, but I think we're gonna see a lot of it burnt during these next three months. And then another 10 billion rand to buy electricity from the independent power producers that supply open cycle gas, turbine electricity to the utility. So 30 billion rand is quite a good envelope but whether it's enough in the context is definitely not, given the poor performance of the coal fleet. Um, and then, of course, the, there's the logistical constraints, particularly around Ankelig. So you can plan to burn diesel, even more diesel, but you actually physically can't do it. So I think a load factor of about 20% is probably realistic, even though South Africans might want higher to try and mitigate load shedding. Uh, but it, it's a big step up from the year to date, it's been around 11%. So we're going to see a big step up in diesel. So that's the biggest lever they can pull. On the supply side, the other big lever is to try to get the coal fleet operating as it should. And that's a big risk factor. I mean, every time there's a promise of an uh, improved energy availability factor, something goes wrong. So we know the boards put these massively stretched targets in place. So by the end of this financial year, which was the end of March, Eskimo was supposed to be at 60% uh, energy availability factor from its fleet. End of the year, it's 56%. And we don't, 
and that includes the full fleet. So when it comes to the coal fleet, it's much lower, and the EAF across the fleet has deteriorated. So it's, it's currently around 52%, so almost half of the fleet's not available. So relying, putting our eggs in that basket <laughs> uh, over this winter, I think as South Africans, I think we've become jaded, so I don't think we're going to rely terribly much uh, on the coal fleet. The other big lever then would be some additional supply, and there, those things are long, long time frames to get those into the system. So there will be some additional supply on the margins from RPPs that are coming on, and uh, a few, the standard offers an important, which is a, a, a program to buy in additional electricity from those that have generating capacity, and that's, that's underway. So there's a few things on the margins that will boost supply, but this winter there's not many big ticket items that are going to come in on the supply side, unless the coal fleet miraculously turns around, but I don't think any of us believe that too much. So they're putting a lot of emphasis on the demand side and trying to get customers to respond. I think customers, or I spoke about jadedness, but customers are so, so frustrated and you know, to ask customers that have been maybe load shed for 10 hours, and if it's, <laughs> if it's stage eight, it's going to be 16 hours in a 32 hour cycle, four hour sort of blocks of load shedding. To ask customers to respond in that context is a big ask. I think there's a lot of frustration, and I think a lot of customers will just say, no, sorry. They are trying to get customers, because all of us now, or many of us now, have some form of inverter in our house or in our office to try and charge that differently. Uh, you know, it's, there's this suggestion that up to a stage of load shedding is now introduced just to cater for this additional load that comes on as the grid comes back to recharge and to sort of rather delay that charge so it doesn't happen straight away. But again, I think the trust deficit and the frustration will mean it will be quite a difficult ask to tell people to do that, but we'll, that, that, is, that could be useful in just sort of uh, depressing some of the demand straight after the after the, the grid comes back on. In the end, it's diesel, it's the coal fleet. If those things perform, then we'll have a bit of a better winter. But I think uh, the experience for the year to date has been very poor, particularly on the coal fleet front. So I think daily load shedding is a reality. Is there a risk of a total grid collapse? There's a lot of talk about that, and there is a lot of fear and anxiety at the moment. And it's only natural when you out of, you know, <laughs> when you don't have electricity for 10 hours in a day, and you have these long protracted periods of load shedding, four-hour blocks, and then after that your substations are gone down, and you don't come back as you should, and then it's a day or it's, it's two days, or maybe in some cases many more than that. You can understand the feeling around a total grid collapse. Are we right on the edge? From an Eskom perspective, from a system perspective, the prospect of a total grid collapse is, is very low uh, because a lot of these systems are automated. So there's a view that these are political decisions, that you know, the system operator must keep the thing going because ministers need their lights and whatever. In some cases, there are those things that we saw recently where there was a BRICS conference and that town got... Uh, Im it was immune from load shedding for that period, but on the whole, as a system operator in Germiston, they are these systems are highly codified and often highly automated. So if uh, the frequency of the system, which is 50 hertz, starts dropping and then or or rising, but dropping in this case, then the system operator's got protocols to keep trying to keep the balance and get that hertz, the 50 hertz back into balance and as I say they automated systems but this is a large uh, system and all over the world uh, the potential for a total blackout is th that is there that, that that is the reality the issue is that low there's no real correlation between load shedding and a total system uh, collapse because load shedding shows that you're controlling it shows that you can see where things, where the vulnerabilities are, and you being proactive about ensuring that the heartbeat of the system, the 50 hertz, is maintained at all times. An event, a big weather event, or something like that, fires, <coughs> those sort of things that have tripped countries all over the world. These, these are possibilities, and I think 
So from an uh, Eskom system, the worst case scenario is that there's a cascading effect and every th all the power stations disconnect from the grid. In the worst case scenario, they all trip as well. In the best case scenario, they, they island themselves and uh, they stay generating, keep their, uh, their auxiliary services operating so that they can bring back those power stations and feed the grid again, get it back into a balance again. And that will be a, a few days, up to five days. In the event that they trip and there's, there's only the Black Start facilities available, we must expect up to two weeks of nothing. But obviously we know that businesses and households have got their own systems in place, so those will be available but from a grid perspective. It's a big risk. So while it's a low risk, I think someone said this week, low risk, but a huge impact. And therefore, I think the view, because of the anxiety in South Africa, I think while Eskom has its contingencies, and they can only say so much because there's a security reasons why you don't talk about your contingencies. But I think from a national perspective, from NECOM, I think in particular, there needs to be some communication as to what protocols and systems are in place should there be the worst case scenario, just because of the high anxiety levels and to rebuild some confidence that all eventualities are catered for. And I think that communication has not happened and it's not clear that there is such a plan. So particularly around security, I think that's where people are most concerned. What will be the state of crime, criminality, if we have a two week um, situation of trying to restore the grid? And it, it has been shown in, around the world that these, these can be very serious, very dire periods and uh, looting the risk of that. So especially around the security forces, the emergency services, fire, medical, all those, I think we need to have some communication. Some, this is our plan. This is what systems are in place. This is how the police are backed up. This is how the emergency services are backed up. And then, of course, amplifying this whole thing could be a food crisis because the agricultural system is very vulnerable to a, a long protracted blackout because that cold chain, if it uh, gets disrupted, you know, it's way, that food gets, goes to waste. So that, that I think also there needs to be some communicating around that. But I think just my earlier point is the risk is low of a total grid blackout, <laughs> but it's almost going to feel like we're in a total, if we get to stage eight, you're going to feel like you're in a total blackout, 16 hours in a 32 hour cycle. And there will be days where it will be more than 12 hours in that you know, 24 hours you, you're gonna feel. So some of those risks might present regardless. So we need to, I think as a country, respond to the anxiety that's out there and that it's being fueled by certain politicians and on social media currently. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.